Okay, um, hey brothers and sisters, um, this is Eric. Thank you for joining me. Now, today I want to talk about uh, a very feared passage, and this is actually from Matthew chapter 7. Now, I've actually, actually talked about this in the past before, but uh, I want to redo this message again because it is at the request of one of the brothers, all right? And I actually remember your request, so I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to be adding a little bit more details that I did not in my other video on this same topic. And I can't exactly remember which video it was uh, and what video title it came under. But there's no harm in doing it again, right? <clears throat> so, for the benefit as well of uh, for many of my newer subscribers. So, um, I really love... I really want to uh, crush this lie once and for all about Matthew chapter 7 about how by their fruits you shall know them and how it is definitely not for us and I'm going to provide three reasons why when Jesus said by their fruits you shall know them it is 100% not referring to us okay the first reason is because it is because of the context now when you rightly divide the word you have to rightly divide the subject matter who was the group that Jesus was referencing when he said those fearful words by their fruits you shall know them now the the target audience the group of people that Jesus was speaking to were the false prophets how do I know that because the verse that says by their fruits you shall know them comes right after verse 15 now verse 15 says beware of false prophets which came to you which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves and immediately immediately after verse 15 it says you shall know them by their fruits so the context the immediate context the direct context is crystal clear Knowing them by their fruits is about identifying false prophet by their fruits. Now, so since this is about identifying the false prophets by their fruits, what fruits do the false prophets produce? Now, the false prophets produce fruits. So the fruit that they produce is equal to the many different prophecies that they give, claiming to be from God claiming to be from God so if it is really from God if that is the original source then there will not be any contradiction at all that is the reason why it says by their fruit you shall know them which means that if it is a real prophecy then you will know that it is from God but if it is not a real prophecy then it is not from God so Jesus was teaching them about the law which they are already familiar with, the Mosaic law. Didn't Jesus say, I've come only for the lost sheep of Israel? Did Jesus also not tell the disciples, go not into the way of the Gentiles? Because the time is not yet. Because Jesus had not gone to the cross, he has not been crucified, he has not been buried, and he obviously did not resurrect yet. When these fearful words were spoken, and the Jews understood it, the Jews knew that he was talking about the, old, uh, the Mosaic law. And we can confirm this by cross-referencing um, it to the passage from Deuteronomy. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Or is it chapter 18? Okay, it says, but anyway, you can check it out for yourself. So this passage in Deuteronomy says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or they shall speak in the name of other gods, even the prophet shall die. So, therefore, the penalty for a false prophet is death under the Mosaic Law. And Jesus, who was speaking to them, was teaching them, was elaborating on yet another law of Moses. Okay? And that is the reason why when we go back to Matthew chapter 7, it says that every tree that beareth not good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, what fire is this? This is obviously hellfire. And that is the exact penalty for a, a false prophet under the Mosaic law. Okay? So, the first reason why Matthew 7 is not referring to us is because 
it is Jesus teaching the Jews about the law. In fact, two verses before that, Jesus was telling the Jews, Enter by the narrow gate that leads to life, and few will find it. Because under the kingdom covenant, which was the, gov which was the covenant that Jesus came to confirm, Jesus came to confirm the kingdom covenant and to fulfill the criteria of the kingdom covenant, the Jew back then had to acknowledge that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah, prophesied by all the Old Testament prophets. Now, if they accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah, then they would have entered the kingdom of heaven, or rather the promised land. But some of the Jews did accept Jesus as the promised Messiah, but many of them did not. And that's the reason why collectively they could not enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right? And then we know what happened after that, right? And, he, and, the, and the Messiah was cut off in the midst of the seven. And then so then came the grace covenant, which is actually technically for them as well, but we have been grafted into it because there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all part of the new covenant. Okay? So, um... Okay, let's come back to that passage. So now, now we know, right? By cross-referencing the passage about how by their fruits you shall know them, know them, Jesus was warning against false prophets. If the fruit that they bear, which means the fruits equal to the different prophecies that come out of their mouth, if they do not come to pass, then we know that it is not from God. And in fact, in verse 22 of Deuteronomy chapter 18, it says the same thing. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, then it is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. You see? So this is not about us. So that is the first reason why when Jesus said, By their fruits you shall know them, it is not referring to us, but rather Jesus was issuing a warning amongst the crowd of the Jews who were Pharisees who refused to come under the kingdom covenant, who refused to accept Jesus as the promised Messiah. The second reason is this. Now, when those words were spoken, when those fearful words were spoken, we were not under the... There was no new covenant yet. There, was no, there were no Christians during Jesus' time. Obviously, because when Jesus spoke those words, He obviously had not died. He obviously wasn't buried. He wasn't resurrected yet. So, there was no new covenant. That, that is the reason why these words are not spoken to us. Alright? Now, the third reason why this is definitely not for us, okay, is because... Hold on, I lost my train of thoughts. <clears throat> Oh yeah, because when you go to um, verse, hold on. When you go to verse 12, Jesus was clearly teaching them about the law. He said, Therefore all things whatever you should, the men do unto you, do you even so to them. Okay, paraphrasing it. Jesus was saying, Do unto others what others do unto you. Alright? For this is the law and the prophets. Do you, do you read that? So this is the law and the prophets. But we are not under the law. So that's my third point. Galatians 3.13 tells us that for Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So you have been redeemed. Previously you were cursed, but now you are not. Um, in Romans 10.4, you know, it says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. And in yet another passage in uh, Romans 6.14, it says, For law has no dominion over you, because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. This is the reason why our spirit can never sin even if it wants to. Because without the law, there is no sin. When we sin, it is our flesh that sins. Why? Because our flesh has not been born again. So, anything that has not been born again would still be subject to the law. 
Now, when Jesus said heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away, it includes the law as well, right? Because the law is part of the word. Now, the law did not pass away and will not pass away until heaven and earth, heaven and earth do. It is because the law will remain to judge, to condemn those who are still under the law. So, if you are a believer under the new covenant, right? If you have been grafted, as, as a Gentile, we have been grafted into the new covenant. You know, we are not under the law anymore. That is the reason why our spirit will not be able to sin even if we want to. And precisely because we are not able to sin in our spirit, that is why we will go to heaven. Because there is no sin for us to carry into heaven. We are not under the law. Right? I mean, this is something that many people do not dare to preach. But this is 100% biblical. We are not under the law. For by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. And if we could fulfill the law, then Christ would have died in vain. So I'm actually taking the opportunity to talk about the law. But really, the main message for today is about the false prophets. And about the fruits that they bear. It is not referring to us at all. And it is crystal clear from the context, from the subject matter, and through cross-referencing it to the passage from Deuteronomy, Jesus was speaking about the false prophet. Again, this has nothing to do with us. When Jesus said, by their fruits, plural, you shall know them. Do not confuse the fruits, plural, used, said by Jesus, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, singular, of Galatians 5, 22-23. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5, is the fruit of the Spirit. It is not the fruit of Michel. It is not the fruit of Peter or John or Jack or Tom. It is the fruit of who? It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that is bearing the fruit in you. So, it is not about you doing the good work in you. It is about Christ. It is about God doing His work through you. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says we are ordained to walk in good works. But wait a second, there is a problem. Because in Philippians, it tells us that for there is no good that dwells in us that is in my flesh. So why would God ask you to do something that you are not capable of doing? And the answer is, God did not tell you to do any works. God is telling you to abide in His Spirit so that you will then be able to, so that He, not you, but so that He will then be able to do His good work through you. So you are just a vessel for God to work through, right? That is why in just two verses before that, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, right? So in verse 10, it then talks about how you are ordained for good works. But there is no contradiction. We are indeed saved by grace through faith, not of works. But the works that is then mentioned in the next verse, in verse 10, is like what I just said. You know, God is saying that He wants to do His work through you. Okay? And the only thing you have to do is to walk in His Spirit. Now, and since we're on this as well, I might as well just talk about walking in the Spirit. Now, you can only walk in the Spirit, obviously, again, if you have the Spirit. And we know that we have the Spirit according to Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. We know that we have the Spirit uh, according to Ephesians 4, 30. That we are sealed by the Holy Spirit when we believe in the gospel of our salvation. It is abundantly clear that the moment that you believe, you are once saved, always saved. Because you are once sealed, always sealed. Now, if you are once sealed, always sealed, then you are once saved, always saved. Because the Bible talks about seal, being sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Bible does not talk about being unsealed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't it wonderful? And I do not know why so many people want to come against it. Right? If it is going to depend on us, then no one will make it into heaven. Okay, so back to, you know, uh, walking in the Spirit. Now, some people may ask, and I have actually done this video in the past before, what exactly does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Now, first of all, let me just give you some good news. The good news is that many of us, most of us who are, we are already walking in the Spirit without realizing it. And the reason why we do not realize that we are already walking in the Spirit is because the devil whispers condemnation into us. The devil tells us you did not do this and you did not do that. Right? But we are already walking in the Spirit. Let me prove to you 
Okay, I'm just going to go through a few things that we have, we have always been doing without realizing it, okay? Number one, our spirit has been born again. That is the reason why we are able to pray to God. Because God is spirit. The Bible says, worship Him in spirit and in truth. But you see, the problem with us is that our spirit has been born dead. We were dead on arrival. And this is the reason why a dead spirit cannot communicate with the living spirit of the living God. So in order for you to communicate with the living God, your spirit must be born again. So if you're able to pray, that proves that you are already walking in a spirit. Because a dead spirit cannot communicate with the living spirit of the living God. Now, the second reason why you have been already been walking in the spirit without realizing it, okay, without realizing it, is that you are able to worship God, that you're able to wait before the Lord. Now, if your spirit is dead, it is carnal. The carnal mind has was nothing to do with the spirit of God. But because your spirit has been born again, so by waiting upon the Lord, by worshiping the Lord, you know. The fact that your heart can be touched when you hear worship songs, that means that your spirit has been born again. And that, that and you're already walking in the Lord. Number three, you are already walking in the spirit when you have the desire to read the word of God. You know, there is this um, hunger for the word of God. Now, if your spirit is dead, why would the carnal mind want to know the word of God? They wouldn't even want to listen to the Word of God. Let it alone read the Word of God and find out what exactly it says. Remember when you were, before you were born again, before you accepted the finished work of Jesus on the cross, remember you had no interest to hear the Word of God. You had no interest to read the Word of God. So the fact that you now have the desire to read the Word of God, that means that you are already walking in the Spirit. Do not let the devil's whispers of condemnation tell you otherwise. You are already walking in the Spirit. And the reason is because you are already in the Spirit. Your Spirit has been born again. So now there is constant fellowship between you and the Spirit. Okay, let me maybe let me just end with this, alright? There are many things that prove that we are already walking in the Spirit. And I pointed out three or four of them. But since this, I also do not want to neglect the um, the topic of the rapture as well. Because that is our blessed hope. This is what we've all been waiting for. And let me end by saying that precisely because we are walking in the Spirit, that is the reason why we know that the rapture is near. We know that the rapture is within sight. Because the Spirit in us that has been born again is now fellowshipping with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. And when God lets us know that the, that the rapture is near, God knows exactly what we understand by near. It is not 10 years, it's not 20 years, that is not near. Alright? This is further confirmation that the Spirit starts to give us little clues, breadcrumbs along the way to encourage us in a way that He knows our born again spirit can understand. Alright? When you think that the rapture is far away, I've mentioned this before. Now, when you think that the rapture is far away, it is because your carnal mind is telling you that. So, the spirit is constantly against the flesh. And the devil is using, he's relentlessly using your flesh against your spirit. Alright? Jesus is coming soon. And you are a child of God. Galatians 3, 26 tells us, For we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. By faith, not by works. But by faith. Once a child of the Father, always a child of the Father. Once you are sealed, always sealed. That is the reason why you are once saved, always saved. Why? Because 
once a child of the father, always a child of the father. Once you are sealed, you always sealed. So if you are once sealed, always sealed. If you are once a child of the father and always a child of the father, how can you ever lose your salvation? Oh, one more thing. This was a great point that was brought up in one of the comments by one of the brother. You know, he said, right, that Jesus said, Depart from me. I never knew you. Notice that it is, it was Jesus saying, Jesus said, I never knew you. Not, I no longer knew you. Now, if you can lose your salvation, then Jesus would have said, I no longer knew you. You get it? It is about him saying he never even knew you. There was nothing to begin with. So how can you lose your salvation if there was nothing to begin with? You didn't even belong to him in the first place. Why? Because this is not talking about you. This is talking about the false prophets. So we got to rightly divide the word of God. Now, any passage that contradicts the foundational doctrine of eternal security is not referring to us, plain and simple. I hope this message has blessed all of you and it has clarified one of the most feared passages in the Bible. Thank you, Holy Spirit.